Last year, I was giving a talk to middle school students in Connecticut, and I opened my presentation by asking them what they thought were the biggest problems in the world. They mentioned war, poverty, overpopulation, climate change, extinction rates, and other things that you'd expect. And then I asked them to raise their hands if they could imagine us solving these problems. And of the 45 students, only a handful did. That was one of the most worrisome moments in my career as a humane educator, somebody who teaches about pressing global issues in an effort to help students be what I call solutionaries for a better world. I thought to myself, if young people can't even imagine us solving our problems, what on earth will motivate them to try? And the irony is that despite our immense challenges, we're actually living in less violent, less discriminatory, and less cruel times than ever before in recorded human history. Add to that our capacity to communicate and collaborate with people across every border and the vast and growing body of knowledge available to us in powerful handheld computers. And the reality is that we've never been better positioned to meet our challenges. We do indeed have a lot of work to do. There are entrenched and pervasive systems in production, energy, transportation, politics, agriculture, and more that are neither just nor sustainable, and they are difficult to change. And if we don't transform them, we may well be headed toward catastrophe. So how will we change them? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to tell you about a famous experiment that was conducted in the 1960s by Stanley Milgram, who was a psychology professor at Yale. Dr. Milgram devised his experiment to examine obedience to authority, largely because he wanted to understand how ordinary German citizens participated in the Holocaust. To find subjects, he put an ad in the paper soliciting participants for a study of memory, which was just a ruse. When the subjects arrived, they were placed in pairs with one in the role of teacher and the other in the role of learner. What the subjects didn't know is that the person that they were paired with was an actor and that the experiment was rigged. All of the subjects were in the role of teacher while the actor was always the learner. So the subject watched as the learner was placed into a room and hooked up to electrodes. And then the subject went to a separate room and was seated in front of a console with levers on it that indicated voltage from 15 volts to 450 volts in 15 volt increments. The subject was told to ask the learner, whom he could hear but no longer see, a question. And if the learner got the question wrong, the subject was instructed to administer an electric shock, starting with 15 volts. And then every time the learner got a question wrong, the subject was supposed to press the next highest voltage, all the way up to the last ones, which were marked XXX, with the words danger, extreme shock. Now, the learner wasn't actually getting shocked, but the subject thought he was. A tape recording was set up so that at specific shock levels, the learner would cry out in pain and bang on the walls and complain about his heart condition and beg for the shocks to stop. And then, if the subject went all the way up to the high voltages, the learner stopped vocalizing at all, leading the subjects to believe that he was either unconscious or dead. So what percentage of people do you think would go up to the highest voltage thinking that they were harming and possibly killing somebody they just met? Well, prior to the experiment, psychiatrists were asked to predict that percentage, and they guessed about one in a 1,000, and they were way off. Two-thirds went up to the end. Two-thirds were willing to administer a painful and possibly fatal shock just because a man in a white lab coat told them to. And those people were no different than you or I. Now, most didn't do this happily or easily. Most questioned Dr. Milgram and became visibly upset, but he just told them to continue. And if they questioned again, he said the experiment required that they continue. And if they questioned further, he assured them that he took all responsibility. Now, the reason why I'm telling you about this experiment is because of that very important word, responsibility. 
Dr. Milgram concluded that the essence of obedience lies in our refusal to see ourselves as responsible for our actions. Now, I realize that the word responsibility can sound like a big old drag, something that our parents and teachers tell us to take when they're critical of us. But I believe that discovering your capacity to take responsibility for your life and choices is one of the most liberating and empowering things you will ever do. When we refuse to let others dictate choices and behaviors that we know in our heart are neither just nor kind, we gain our freedom to live with integrity. Now, how will you go about taking responsibility? To get back to that question, how will we change problems in the world and create a more humane and healthy world, the answer lies with our willingness to take responsibility. Now, I'm not just talking about not doing things that are clearly immoral or cruel or wrong, because we all know the importance of doing that. I'm primarily talking about resisting everyday things, like products and clothes and foods that are produced in ways that are violent and destructive. We may think that we would never administer a painful or deadly electric shock just because an authority figure told us to, but in a single day, we may choose products produced by people who worked under ghastly conditions or even as slaves and eat foods that were produced through unimaginable animal cruelty and environmentally devastating practices. Taking responsibility for our choices is tough. It requires us to be willing to learn about terrible things that are happening in the world, things that aren't part of most school curricula and which we won't see on product labels. And then, when we start to learn about and take more responsibility for our choices, we might find it hard to believe that others are still asleep, which will then call upon us to embrace a new level of responsibility, to wake others up so that they'll join us in meeting our challenges. And when that moment comes for you, there's an image I'd like you to keep in mind. I'd like you to imagine two fires the first is a campfire. It's warm and inviting, and people are gathered around, and more keep coming, each bathed in the glow of the fire, smiling, fully engaged, and so glad to be there. And now I'd like you to imagine a forest fire, burning out of control. Everyone's running, choking on the smoke, desperate to get away. Each of us has a fire inside of us. It's the fire of our passions and deepest concerns. How we tend our fire is critical. If we tend it well, adding fuel in just the right proportion, we can become a campfire, drawing people close to learn from and work with us toward common positive goals. But if we add too much fuel, we may start to burn out of control, pushing others away, and possibly even burning out. Now, what's this fuel I'm talking about? It's knowledge about problems in our world and systems that are unsustainable and unjust and cruel. We know we're not adding enough fuel if we have no real desire to make a difference at all and if no one is inspired by our example. And we know we're adding too much fuel if we start to feel overwhelmed or fall into despair or become so angry and judgmental that others avoid us. It's so important to find that sweet spot that enables you to be a campfire, especially in today's world. The problems we face are eminently solvable, but it's up to each of us to ensure that the window to avert catastrophe doesn't shut. And just in case you're feeling like this task is too big, I offer you this important truth. A life lived as a campfire is deeply joyful and rewarding. It's a surefire way to surround yourself with wonderful people, and perhaps most important of all, it's a life in which you get to look in the mirror every day and have respect and appreciation for the person who looks back at you. So what kind of campfire will you be? What problems will you work to solve? To answer that question, I'd like you to imagine that you're very old, approaching the end of your life. 
Picture yourself sitting on a park bench on a beautiful day, breathing clean air. In your future, there will be no more war or poverty. Species will be recovering, and all of us will treat each other and the environment and other animals with respect and compassion. Humane and restorative systems will abound. And now imagine that a child joins you on the park bench. That child has been studying history in school and learning about much darker times. And knowing you lived through some of those times, that child asks you this question. What did you do to help make the world better? What would you like to be able to tell that child you did? I so hope that you will use your good mind and your big heart in the great and meaningful pursuit of taking responsibility for answering that question, beginning today and for the rest of your life. Thank you.